What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. As you all know, it's right there. And that enables us to keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please, please, please hit that subscribe button. Tell a friend, each one, teach one. We really appreciate your guys' support. And thank you for helping us grow. So hit that subscribe button. Now, today, we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by Mr. David Lotwin from d and one half of the famous d and recording studios, among many other things. So, David, thank you for coming through, sir. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for uh, doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Yes. So, David uh, connected me with 45 King. Uh, many people had seen that interview, so now I'm glad that uh, David has agreed to do one for himself. And one of the things that I had always heard about, learned about, read about, was with your partner, Doug, that you guys had, uh, Doug was much more, according to even to you, more musically inclined, and you were more on the business side of things Sure. Uh, for your studio. So with D&D, what... When did that register to you early on that you guys kind of had to go in different directions within the d d Studios partnership? Well, just growing up, uh, you know, we grew up together and Doug was always a better musician than I. You know, he just, he has incredible ears and, you know, he's just that guy. So um, when we started, we were both engineering. It was just the two of us. Um, he did a little more and I did the paperwork. But as we developed... You know, if you're the guy dealing with the billing and dealing with, oh, my God, you got to give me downtime because, you know, there was a problem with the monitors, whatever it is. You don't want to also be the guy in the room engineering because that's a certain relationship. And you, you don't after the session go, well, you know, uh, there was an issue and are you going to take care of it? So we kind of split roles pretty early on. Um I was very good at dealing with people, with uh, relationships and, uh, you know, marketing and, and all that kind of stuff. And Doug is just, uh, like I said, he's just an incredible engineer and musician. And so, we, and you don't want a partner, what do you need a partner that does exactly what you do? I mean, the whole point of a partnership is uh, like a puzzle that we fit together and we covered all bases. Um, so it worked out really well. I really enjoyed what I did there and he enjoyed what he did there. Okay. And then as you guys started building the brand and becoming successful, then how did you, and what was the roles as far as, uh, acquiring equipment? Well, that we both made decisions on, you know, we, we saw what else was out there. We very, was pre-internet. So we, you yeah, know, we read our magazines and we went to other studios and what clients wanted, the new hot gear, you know, the new hot digital reverb. When we started, we had a plate reverb literally in my office that like I couldn't answer the phone because it would go through the microphone of the reverb into the studio. So it was, you know, a big box that a signal was sent into, there was a microphone and it reverberated in that box and went back. So if you were in there talking, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a good idea. So, you know, as digital came and as MIDI came and as it was really the beginning, I mean, uh, even keyboards had patch cords. They, it was very beginning of digital. So we kind of grew up in that era where, Oh man, you know, Lexicon's coming out. Oh, sorry. Lexicon's coming out with the, the new greatest thing. And, and we just really looked at the market, what we could afford. And we got the best gear we could uh, for what we had. It's interesting about that because once I want to go back and talk about some earlier stuff, but once we, you get to the mid 90s, and I would say D&D was, was an established brand and was really there. I was always curious because I had been there a few times uh, in that era, but I was always curious how you guys as a studio and even the producers kind of blended using the new technology, but keeping that old dustier sound. How, how did you as a company and did you see Premier and other people, Ski Beats, different people that were in there, how did they beat miners? How did they balance that? Well, 
you know, our console was an MCI, actually an ANB. So we had a really kind of classic console. Um, in fact, the one from, I want to say the B room, uh, Elvis actually recorded on. So it was an older console. So it had that, that sound and that sweetness. And again, we didn't have the greatest gear. We just didn't. We didn't have Neve and Studer and SSL and, you know, so our gear kind of reflected what we could afford. Uh, Doug and I, uh, you know, we, we uh, created it from just starting an 8-track and making some money. We, we each put in some money at the beginning. And so we never had like this big loan or we took out these big contracts. Uh, actually, we at one point we uh, got some uh, Neve EQs. And, you know, we, we went to Siemens and we, uh, uh, you know, paid them off. But in general, as we got money, we got gear. Um, and when it really changed, uh, in, as it moved forward, when, when Apple came out and, and it stopped going to tape and started going right to digital, um, you know, that was a big transition for us. And, and that's what the clients wanted. They wanted Pro Tools. And, uh, you know, we started doing that, but that's, that really changed the sound. And, uh, um, you know, that was, that was, a, that was a big leap. The digital outboard gear, everybody wanted, we wanted the latest, the greatest, but then the signal going through the board still had that old school kind of flavor with the, the, the older two inch tape machine. Which is remarkable because it's funny when I think about it, obviously I've been in the studio less than you have, but uh, the bottom line is thinking back to going in studios in general where they had actual rooms where you would record music as opposed to things being basically a, a monitor and then the vocal booth or something. It's, uh, it's just remarkable, the evolution of how sound is recorded, how it's remarkable. processed. How it's processed. <laughs> As you saw that evolution happening, I was intrigued because in New York, the rap didn't have as much as time went on. Uh, the live musicianship faded from it a lot. Absolutely. Whereas in Los Angeles, Oakland, and the South, even the Midwest, they still used bass or they still used drums or they sure. still had... Uh, some level of live instrumentation a lot was that some why do you think that you guys or the New York sound lost that or got away from that because that New York style of hip-hop was basically just sampling I mean that's what it was it was taking as you know old records and break beats and sections and and creating new sounds from it um when we first opened we had a huge live room I mean, it was, you know, it was a big, big room that we spent a lot of time and money. And uh, we had an isolation booth for, for drums. And um, over time, we almost never used that room. And in fact, when Primo took over the studio, he flipped it so the, the live room became the control room. And the control room became an uh, overdub room. Um, he had someone, uh, he was always in B, he, he never went to A, but he, he had a partner up there, or not a partner, but someone he, uh, you know, was doing some work with, and that's, that's what they did, they switched the room, uh, which was quite interesting, and, and it became this big, beautiful control room that, that was really large, um, probably wasn't as, because when we set up the control room, we, we had like, uh, Al Firestein, who was an amazing audio technician, come in and spectrum analyze the room. And, oh, my God, there's a bass trap in that corner and you got to put padding there. So we really made the control room very conducive to being a control room. Um, our Yuri, we had Yuri 813As with a subwoofer and everything was uh, measured out. And we tried to get it as true uh, as we could. Right. And... and um... Speaking of that, since sound is what this is about, the people look at D&D &D as this rap New York thing, but I know at least early on, you guys did a lot of different types of genres recording wise. Sure. And one that I remember that kind of blew me away later because <clears throat> I didn't really listen to their music, but I happened to see 
was Delight. Um, we did that whole album. Yeah. So that, that was done in the A room, not Primo's room, the, the room I'm talking about. But and, that being said, I wanted to get uh, from you what what was appealing to these different sounds and these different types of artists to what where D and D worked for all of them. Well, that was that was kind of the beginning of us really taking off. Uh, at that point, we were doing a lot of twelve-inch remixes, dance remixes, and that's how kind of Delight found us, um, like Todd Terry and Tony Humphreys and the Latin Rascals and Coro Cover Girls, you know that kind of stuff. Uh, TKA. Um, so we had kind of a, a real niche in that before we got into the hip hop. And then uh, a lot of remixes, which kind of became an art that has definitely changed. I don't want to say it's gone away, but that was a whole business into itself that really doesn't exist anymore. Yes, uh, which um, I want to get to that in a second, because the thing I, re I would always read all the credits, <clears throat> but it wasn't until later, um, and I want to make sure it was you guys, but it seems like you guys did, or the Fat Boys recorded a lot early on with you guys. Yes. Um, and obviously we just lost uh, Prince Marky D, who I had literally just spoke to a few days uh, ago. Oh, it's a shame. We um, were in a clubhouse last night uh, with Charlie Stetler and Curtis Blow and uh, DJ Red Alert and uh, Dr. Dre from Dr. Dre and Ed Lover. And, just everyone going over just these great stories of uh, Marky and the Fat Boys and Charlie, and they were just they were just pranksters and just so much fun. Um, and they were among our first uh, hip hop, certainly the first real hip hop that came out and, and made a lot of noise. We did some Tila Rock stuff um, right around that, and then. Uh, we started doing Latin Rascal stuff, um, who were great, the greatest editors. Uh, you know, they, they just pre-digital with a, with a grease pencil and a, and a razor blade. And Charlie Stetler was involved with them. I'm pretty sure he managed them. And then he was like, ah, oh, let me bring the fat boys in. And uh, it started from there, really. Yeah, because they, they were repeat customers. Um, but I was also curious because with Tila Rock, I remember like housing with the T's, but I noticed that some stuff at D and D early, it was more that it was mixed there as opposed to sure. always recorded there. Sure. So what, what did you guys find about the mixing that was drawing the rap people in? The sound, you know, we didn't have the greatest uh, automation. Again, we didn't have an SSL and an Eve. In fact, our, our first automation that we got, and, and Doug would know the name better, actually took up two channels in the 24 uh, channels. So we had to have an automation channel. So it was very elementary automation. And you needed two guys like Primo would have, like Eddie, and they would they would make the moves because you needed forehand to make the fader moves. And, um, but we... We made that move to get the automation and, uh, you know, as stuff developed and, and came out and wasn't as expensive uh, in the first rounds, you know, we got it. Um, but it was the sound. You, you can't, I mean, I have a great setup at home, but it's nothing like Yuri's and 20 inch subwoofer in a, an environment. You can turn it all the way up and, um, you know, then you go out to the lounge and AB it, put it on the little speakers we have there. Um, Primo would a lot of times at the beginning take it down to his car because he knew exactly the sound he wanted. Uh, so, you know, we 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 tried to grow with the times in our, in our D and D way. Um, but again, a lot of the records, not everything was 100% recorded mixed uh, at D and D. We touched a lot of stuff. We touched a lot of vocals, programming, uh, mixing. That kind of stuff. Uh, Delight happened to be done almost 100%, I think. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of records were. Certainly the Gangstar stuff and J. Rue and Group Home and all that kind of stuff 
you know, that was Primo's home and that's where he did everything. But there were other records where, uh, Right Said Fred, uh, we did remixes on, um, Relax, you know, uh, they came in and did remixes, Erasure, uh, all, all kinds of really cool stuff. Uh, be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.